Well, the title of the series is The God You Can Trust, and the title of the message is The Lord Who Is Faithful. You see the relationship between the two. Beginning a new sermon series today, The God You Can Trust, and starting today and for the next five or six Sundays, we'll be looking at what the Bible says about the faithfulness of God. Now, I want to jumpstart our thinking by looking straight to the Scripture this morning. I'm going to be looking at several passages of Scripture. Normally, I announce the passage. You turn to it. It's open in your Bible. I'm going to give you a half a dozen passages this morning. I'm going to ask you to just look at the screen. But as always, let's stand for the reading of God's Word. From Exodus 34, and he, God, passed in front of Moses, proclaiming, the Lord, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness, maintaining love to thousands and forgiving wickedness, rebellion, and sin. Deuteronomy 7, 9. Know therefore that the Lord your God is God. He is the faithful God, keeping his covenant of love to a thousand generations of those who love him and keep his commands. From Isaiah 49. This is what the Lord says. The Redeemer and Holy One of Israel to him who was despised and abhorred by the nation, to the servant of rulers, kings will see you and rise up, princes will see and bow down, because, here it is, the Lord who is faithful, the Holy One of Israel, who has chosen you. Two passages from the New Testament. Paul to the Thessalonians. From chapter 5 and verse 24, he says very simply about our sanctification, the one who calls you is faithful and he will do it. And then finally from Hebrews 10, let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess for he who promised is faithful. Amen? Amen. All right, thanks very much. You may be seated. Now, those are the scriptures, and we've just looked at them, but for a moment, let me just isolate some of these phrases that we just read. Abounding in love and faithfulness. He is the faithful God, the Lord who is faithful. The one who calls you is faithful. He who promised is faithful. Are we beginning to see a theme? And many other verses could, could have been added to this list to bring home the point that God is faithful. But they would all basically say the same thing. God is a faithful God. He cannot be anything else. He cannot behave any other way. And so he can always be trusted. Now that's true, isn't it? You can trust God, can't you? I mean, let's face it, life is scary. The world is a difficult place under the best of circumstances, and none of us live under the best of circumstances. Every week. We send out prayer requests via text and email and share them with each other because we hear of someone else who is ill, of someone who is hurting, of someone who is in trouble. And, and that's just normal for every church in this country. Half the congregation need prayer at any given time. In a world where every day brings new revelations of chaos and confusion, 
We wonder at times if we can really trust God. I mean, has he taken his hand off the wheel? It's one thing to say, I trust God when the sun is shining and the bills are paid. It's something else to trust him when the dark clouds settle around us and the bill collectors are on the phone. We've talked before about how uncertain life can be. Any day your life can suddenly change for the worse. I mean, that's just life in this planet. The boss tells you that the company's downsizing and your job no longer exists. Friends move away, marriages dissolve, children leave home. Our health does not last forever. Friends and loved ones pass away, and many of us live in fear of cancer or that sudden heart attack. In a world where everything seems to change so quickly, God is the only constant. Moses said he is the faithful God. And in that context, it means that you can trust him because he doesn't change. He is faithful. I wonder, I don't know, do we have any Marines here today? I'm not going to say former Marines because there's no such thing as a former Marine. If you're a Marine, you're a Marine. Anyone? All right. Who knows the Marine motto? Go ahead. Semper Fi. I heard both of them, Semper Fidelis and Semper Fi. Semper Fidelis, usually shortened to Semper Fi, which means always faithful. But how many people do you know that you could actually say that about? always faithful. Who do you know who always does exactly what they say they will do? Now, before you answer that, let me rephrase the question. How many people do you know who do exactly what they say every single time? All right, let me rephrase that. How many people do you know who do exactly what they say every single time and do it with such thoroughness and perfection that you never have to worry about anything that they say or anything that they do? All right, let's tighten it up one more time. How many people do you know who no matter what the circumstances, no matter how they feel, will always do exactly what they say every single time and do it with such thoroughness and perfection that you never have to worry about anything they say or do because you know that if they say it, they will definitely do it without fail, without change, without excuse. All right, well, now we've just gone from the possible to the impossible, right? Because no human being can fit that last description. Most of us probably think that we know some people who are generally reliable. We know some very reliable people. We know some very dependable people. But the end, in the end, the question is not about reliable or dependable people really not about people at all because no person could ever meet all the qualifications of that last question which is really about God he alone is 100% faithful 100% of the time we live in a world of broken promises Presidents promised no new taxes and then raised them. Leaders pledge peace and secretly all the time they're making plans for war. 
Couples make sacred vows before God to be wed for as long as we both shall live. And then they're divorced in a rather short time. The host of a national radio show was discussing several prominent celebrities whose personal hypocrisies had been exposed. That could be just about anyone on any day of the week. But then he asked the penetrating question, is there anyone out there who is what he claims to be? If you're looking at human men and women, the answer is no. None of us are what we claim to be. If you look at the Lord, you will discover that he is always everything that he claims to be. Again, let's look at some scripture. Numbers 23, 19, God is not a man that he should lie. What does that tell you about humankind? We're characteristically liars. God is not a man that he should lie, nor a son of man that he should change his mind. Does he speak and then not act? Does he promise and not fulfill? God is not a liar. God doesn't change his mind. He always knows his purpose. He always fulfills his purpose. If he says something, he does it. And if he promises, he always keeps his promise. John 17, 3, Jesus refers to the Father as the only true God. Now, he doesn't mean that he's the only true God and therefore all other gods are false. I mean, it does mean that. But that word true there is another word that means faithful. He's the only true God. 1 Corinthians 1, 9. Paul says, God who called you into fellowship with his son, Jesus Christ our Lord, is faithful. 1 Corinthians 10, 13, which is a verse we're going to look at later, which talks about God's faithfulness in the midst of our going through temptation. It's a great verse. We're going to look at it in a couple weeks. Paul says, but God is faithful. 1 John 1, 9, one of the first verses I ever memorized, and you'll see why. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. He is faithful and just. 1 John 5, 20, he refers to the Lord as him who is true. And I could keep going. Are you beginning to see that God's faithfulness is not some minor or secondary part of his character? To say that God is faithful goes to the very core of who God is. He keeps his word because if he didn't, he wouldn't be God. Everything that we believe and know about God is based on his faithfulness. He is a God who can be trusted to keep his promises. He never goes back on his word. He will never let us down. If God were not faithful, we would have no hope for salvation. Our very hope for salvation is based on the fact that he made promises to us and we're expecting him to keep his word. If God could not be trusted, we would dare not pray. If God didn't keep his word, then we would have no hope for the future. And we would all go down to death in great fear, not knowing 
what judgment would bring and with no assurance of eternal life. But we can live by faith and we can walk in hope and we can die without fear because we serve a God who can be trusted. His promises are real and true. He keeps his word. God is faithful. Now, with that as an introduction, let's think together about three specific implications of the faithfulness of God. Number one, if God is faithful and true, then every word he says is true. Every word he says is true. The Bible contains several words for truth, and one of the most important is the Hebrew word emeth, which means stability, firmness, and certainty. And we get our English word amen or amen from the Hebrew emeth. Every time we say amen, which, by the way, is the proper way to pronounce the word, what we're saying is, this is certain. Or, yes, this is absolutely true. Therefore, to say God is true is the same as saying God is faithful. Here's a simple definition. God's faithfulness means that he is the truth. Everything he says and does is certain. And he is 100% reliable 100% of the time. In the words of theologian Lewis Perry Schaefer, he not only advances and confirms that which is true, but in faithfulness abides by his promises and executes every promise or warning he has made. God is a God who means what he says and says what he means. He does everything he does the way he promised he would do it. And he does everything he says he will do. He does not fail. He does not forget. He does not falter. He does not vacillate. If he said it, he means it, and you can stake your life on it. And where is it that we find the true words of God? In the Bible, God has given us an entire book filled with his words. And if that be so, then our job is to read that book, study it, memorize it, learn it, build your life on it. We are to love God's word to the point that his words flow through us like the blood that flows through our veins. God says amen over every word he speaks. This means that we can trust the entire Bible because all of it comes from God. Whether we read it in Genesis or Joshua, Lamentations or Luke, 1 Samuel, 2 Tim or 3 John, Ruth or Revelation, we can trust what we read because God is the ultimate author And every word he says is true. Paul wrote to Timothy, and I love this passage. All scripture is God breathed. Those two words in the text, God breathed 
is actually only one word in the Greek language. It's a combination word. Theonoustos. Theo is God. Noustos is breath or spirit. Every word of Scripture comes from the very breath of God. That's why they're always referred to as the Holy Scripture. Holy because it came out of God's mouth. God breathed. It's true, honest, accurate, and reliable. So here's the second implication of God's faithfulness. Number two, every promise will be kept. Every word he says is true. Every promise he has made, he will keep. Because God is faithful, he keeps every promise that he makes. Have you ever taken the time to go into the word of God and then begin to trace out the promises of God? Some versions of the scripture, you can buy the Bible and all the promises are color-coded in the same color. Or you can read through your scripture and every time you see God making a promise to people and you know from your own understanding that that promise also relies, uh, you know, comes to me. Mark it down. Write it out. Study. And then pray the promises of God. God, you promised this in your word. And I'm praying it for me. Second Corinthians 120, Paul says, no matter how many promises God has made, they are yes in Christ. And so through him the amen is spoken by us to the glory of God. One modern version has that first phrase this way. Whatever God says gets stamped with the yes of Jesus. God the Father made a promise. God the Son said, yes, it is so. God the Holy Spirit writes the promise in the book and then applies that word to our hearts when we read it. And so all three persons of the Godhead unite in bringing God's promises to us. And that's why when we read a promise of God, we can truly say amen. If God has said it, and it applies to me, I can count on it. This is one of my favorite passages in Scripture about how God keeps his promises. It's from uh, Joshua 21, where we read this. So the Lord gave Israel all the land he had sworn to give their forefathers, and they took possession of it and settled there. Do you notice right there it says the Lord gave them everything he promised? The Lord gave them rest on every side, just as he had sworn to their forefathers. Not one of their enemies withstood them, the Lord handed all their enemies over to them, and here it is, not one of all the Lord's good promises to the house of Israel failed, every one was fulfilled. You see that? Isn't that great? Not one promise failed, every one was fulfilled fulfilled. But the book of Joshua shows us how those promises were fulfilled, how God kept all those promises. And I would point out four things. Number one, they didn't happen overnight. It took seven years for Israel to fully possess the promised land. 
the fulfillment of those promises was not without a struggle. I mean, they had to fight many battles to get there. The keeping of those promises was not without some failure on the part of God's people. They were not always faithful to the Lord. The Lord was faithful to them. They weren't faithful to him. And four, not everyone lived to see the day of fulfillment. Some died along the way. But here's the point. What God said, he did. No one could have said in advance how it would happen, but it did. In the end, the Israelites were totally victorious because God promised them that they would be and saw to it that they were. Some time ago, I read a little bit about Gladys Aylward, who was a missionary in China before World War II. And when the Japanese army invaded northern China, she was forced to flee Yang Chang, taking with her 100 orphans. And as she led the orphans into the mountains, she despaired of ever making it to safety. And after a sleepless night of worry, she was reminded by one of her orphans, a 13-year-old girl, that things looked bad for the Israelites at the Red Sea when they were being pursued by Pharaoh's chariots, but that God delivered them out through the sea. And Gladys said, but I'm not Moses. And the girl replied, well, of course you aren't, but the Lord is still God. Is that God's word for some of you today? I mean, no matter what mountains or desert or sea lay in front of you, you may not be a Moses, but the Lord is still God, and you can trust him. Are you overwhelmed by your circumstances? The Bible never promises that you won't be. Say, well, God will never put on me more than I can handle. Show me that anywhere in Scripture. It's not in there. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But people are overwhelmed by their circumstances all the time. You looking for some word of hope, something to believe in? Read the promises of God. Read them and write them down. Put them up where you can see them when you get up and walk around in the morning. Take the promises of God, post them around your house. Pray the promises of God and then stand on them. What are we saying? Standing on the promises of God. You probably heard the line, we sing standing on the promises, but most of the time we're just sitting on the premises. Stand on the promises of God. Every word he said is true. Every promise he made will be kept. And because God is faithful, number three, every trial has a purpose. Every trial has a purpose. God will not tempt anyone. He cannot be tempted and he will tempt no one. That's James chapter 1. But he will send trials. Trials and temptations are not the same thing. Trials are tests put forth by God to teach you something. Temptations are occasions for sin put forth by the devil. Two entirely different things. God will put you through a trial because he wants a better you on the other side of the trial. 
But every trial has a purpose. And that's the point. Nothing happens by chance or happenstance to the children of God. I have observed that when bad times come, when uh, things happen that we don't expect, we tend to think that God has forgotten us for a while or that what happened was a mistake and that this has no purpose. Which is thoroughly unbiblical thinking. One of my favorite sayings is, you never hear God say, boy, I didn't see that coming. <laughs> Nothing catches God by surprise. Might catch you by surprise, but God saw it coming down the road. He knew from the foundation of the world what's going to happen to you. But here's the thing I've noticed about mature saints people who understand the Word of God and actually apply it to their lives. No matter what I'm going through, God has a purpose in it and there's something here he's trying to teach me. Consider these four truths from Scripture. Number one, God knows what I am going through. Job 23, 10, he knows the way that I take. When he has tested me, I will come forth as gold. God knows what I'm going through. Number two, he uses my trials to help me grow. Now, if you have a little longevity and some retrospect, you can look back over your life and say, those times in my life when I was growing the most was when I was going through this thing. That trial that made me depend upon God for my next breath. That's when I was growing. Romans 5, 3 and 4, we also rejoice in our suffering because we know that suffering produces perseverance, perseverance character, character hope, and hope does not disappoint us because God has poured out his love into our hearts by the Holy Spirit whom he has given us. Trials, sufferings produce perseverance perseverance, character, character, hope. And it sounds an awful lot like James chapter 1, so that's the next one. He calls me to rejoice in my pain, rejoice in my trial. James says it this way, consider it pure joy, my brothers, whenever you face trials of many kinds. Actually, that word means to fall into. When you fall into trial of many kinds, because you know, again, that the testing of your faith develops perseverance, endurance, faithfulness, stick to -itiveness. Perseverance must finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. And Peter says it this way. He invites me to submit to my faithful creator. 1 Peter 4.19, those who suffer according to God's will. Anyone here know that you can suffer according to God's will? Clearly taught in scripture. Sometimes our suffering is according to God's will because he has a purpose he's working out. All right. Those who suffer according to God's will should commit themselves to their faithful creator and continue to do good. A small boy was flying a kite high in the sky one day when it drifted into a cloud bank and disappeared from view. And a passerby asked the little boy what he was doing. He said, I'm flying my kite. 
And the man looking up and seeing only the cloud bank said, I don't see any kite. How do you know it's still up there? He said, well, I don't see it either, but I know it's up there because every once in a while there's a tug on the line. Many Christians feel that God has disappeared just when they need him most. Be encouraged. Just because you can't see him doesn't mean he's not there. Keep holding on to the Lord. He is faithful even when you cannot feel his presence. Right? We don't walk by feelings. We walk by faith. Sooner or later, though, you will feel the tug on the line. And he lets you know that he's still there. And he has a purpose for the trial that you're going through. How faithful is God? Faithfulness is at the core of who God is, and he cannot be otherwise. Because God is faithful... Every word he says is true. Every promise he has made will be kept. And every trial has a purpose. Let's pray together. God, I thank you so much for your word. I thank you that throughout the Old Testament and the New, we are taught repeatedly how you are the true and faithful God. And that means we can trust you. Help us, God, to put more and more of our trust about more and more in our lives, in you, to trust you for more to the point where we are just trusting you for everything. And I would pray, God, that if, if people are being shown here today Here's an area of your life where you are not trusting me. That we would throw up our hands and say, okay, God, that's yours now too. I'm sorry I hung on to it for so long. I want to trust you with every part of my life. My ability to trust has nothing to do with my character and everything to do with yours. I'm not trustworthy, but you are. And I trust you, not only because your word says so and your word is always true, but because in my experience, 50 years of following, you have never lied, you have never let me down. My ability to trust you is based on your character. You're a trustworthy God. Help me, God, to walk in faith every day, to walk trusting you. It's my prayer for me and for this congregation. In Jesus' name, amen. I invite our ushers to come.